Hey everybody, you're very welcome back to In Forest and Lands. My name is Joe Price, Wilderness Skills Instructor, and behind the camera, fascinated by Project Bluebeam, is Ida Olsen. <laughs> Hello everyone. <laughs> Today, I want to talk to you in this video about probably one of the most misunderstood, misrepresented, and underutilized things in the world of bushcraft, preparedness, and survival. It is the humble mill bank bag. Probably one of the best things that you can carry to sort out problems like you see behind me. But first, we gotta go to the classroom and learn a little bit of science. So we've got ourselves nice and comfortable underneath this beautiful Norwegian spruce and I want to share some tips and also some kit when it comes to water purification. There's two things that you need to decide before you're going to gather water in the woods or on trips, but you need a method of boiling. If you're not going to carry heavy filtration systems, and even if you do, I always recommend boiling. So today, I don't have my cookers with me because I knew in my head before we were coming out today that we'd be using fire, fire as a method of boiling. The more steps of filtration you remove, the closer you get to boiling, so that's always something to consider. But in my water kit that I carry, I'll always have a millbank bag. You see here, that we're going to discuss in depth today. There, wrapped around my bowl. I'll always have some form of boiling. So I'll have a stainless steel bottle, can be any make you want it to be, once it's single walled, two cups, and then I have a little water gathering kit. If you notice, the millbank bag, although it has some graduated cylinders on it, or graduated marks for use with the millbank bag, my bottle doesn't. And when you're out hiking in the woods or when you're out foraging or in fact anytime you go outdoors for strenuous activity, I always like to have what I call a scientific method of calculating my water intake. So you can use whatever method you want. I like the hydropack system because it's small, it packs up really really tight, in fact you could wrap it around your bottle if you wanted to, but this is a two litre one with graduated milliliter marks on the side of it, puncture resistant plastic, nice big opening nozzle and I can strap it up here and part of the reason I like this as well is not just to intake water and keep an eye okay I'm doing physical heavy activity in the summertime I'm going to need at least four liters of water over the day so I can see it but I can drop chlorine tablets in here too to help me purify it some more it's got straps so I can put it on my bag I can heat my boiling water up in this in the winter months and put my boiling water in here and use it as a much more malleable way of warming my core temperature I like to put these in my sleeping bags and so on. Also, in my water gathering kit, I have a signal panel. This one is from my Yervin bag. Shout out to Gone Off Pat Gav Nolan for hooking me up with my Yervin bag. But I have a signal panel. Why a signal panel, Joe? Well, sometimes when we're at camp, you shouldn't always be camping super close to water sources, and that's another video for another time. But you might have to travel back and forth to a river, to a lake, to a stream, to get your water to bring back to camp in your water gathering equipment. So I just like to have an extra signal panel, just like when I'm in thickly dense woods like this, that I can see my way back to camp or I can mark or blaze a trail on my way there. I have another small little hydro pack. I used to have two but unfortunately I stabbed my second one but I have this smaller version of it here and again this is for winter. It's a scientific graduated method. I can roll it up, keep it in my pocket, stay warm, keep my hands warm around camp. I, can, I used to have two for each individual pocket on my trousers and on my jacket just to keep my hands warm in the winter time. Next I like to carry some cordage. I'm a big believer in carrying individual cordage for individual tasks. Most people outside will carry a big roll of cordage and then chop it up as they need it. It's not so good for the environment. It's not so good for your pocket because you have to keep buying cordage. So I prefer to carry some cordage in each kit that's specific to use with each kit and I'm not having to cut and worry about it or forget cordage. Redundancy is fantastic. So some cordage. And then a nice big blaze orange pouch to keep it all in. It goes without saying. So now I'd like to show you how the millbank bag works and what it can remove and what it should remove. So that's the bare minimal kit that I carry for water purification. Depending on countries and where you're going, you may need to carry more and you may need to carry less. Again, we'll cover that topic in another video. But the reason why I can carry such a minimal kit is because in the Nordic countries, water sources are so pure. In fact, conservative estimates, in my opinion, way above 80% of drinkable water sources in the Nordic countries are totally fine, except for the one thing that you need to remove, which this does here. But sadly, in other countries, 
countries, say like Ireland and like Denmark, the water sources ain't so pure. So you're going to need something a bit more heavy to kind of get rid of those things, especially in and around cities and industrial estates. Recent studies have shown that heavy metals are now starting to appear in mushrooms in places like Denmark and stuff, which means that they are getting into the water table. So it's something to be aware of, do a bit of research, get a bit more involved in nature when you're out and about and see how the water sources are around you so you can act appropriately. But now, with the help of my five pine cones, I'm going to explain just exactly what we're trying to do. So here on my Millbank bag, I'm going to build, using my pine cones, all the bad things that we may find in water. First thing out the gate, and the most obvious one is turbidity. Turbidity is a very hard thing for an Irish man like me to say, but basically it means leaves, sticks, twigs, the big things that you can see with your naked eye. The second thing is bacteria. Goes without saying, you can't see this with the naked eye, but this is the stuff that's going to turn your camping trip into a very awkward trip and give you your upset tummies. Next of all, is protozoas. Protozoas belong to that same kind of microscopic family that is going to make your life very hard when you're outdoors. Next are the two rarest ones, but they have started to appear in water sources. So again, always check your countries. Is heavy metals. Again, this is from industry. This is runoff. This is uh, really nasty stuff that you don't want to find in there and you actually need very specialized equipment to remove. And unfortunately, pesticides. Again, that's something that's, if you're camping next to farmland, if you're camping next to industry, if your water source happens to be running through agricultural land, you're going to find pesticides in the water. So here we have our water system here. I know I'm in the Nordic countries and I've got good water sources available. I'm not near any industry or cities. I'm in the mountains. I can remove heavy metals and I can remove pesticides straight out the gate. Now we're left with turbidiness, bacteria and protozoas. So this is where our mill bank comes in and this is where our mill bank shines because if I was to put my water into my mill bank bag and it was to work the way it's supposed to work, I can remove turbidity from my water. And that's the big sticks, the stuff you can see with your naked eye. But I'm still left with my bacteria and my protozoa and then that's where my steel bottle comes in, I boil it, and my bacteria and my protozoa are gone, and I am left with clean drinking water that's safe. So we're here by a water collecting source, and I like this one because it's a good example. It's a very easy water source to get to. But as you can see out here, we have three different types of what I was talking about with turbidness. Three different types of stuff that's in the river that we don't want in our drinking water. This is a great example because we do have a fresh flowing river coming in from my right that's flowing out here into the lake. But because of the wind blowing in and up this river, it stops all these particulates and gathers them here. So the first, the most obvious one that we can see is the white stuff flowing on the water. This is known as foam lines. Most people think this is pollution or an indicator of a bad water source, but it means that the river is alive. What it is, is as the river churns stuff up, it breaks up these small materials, so like dead fish, leaves, pine needles, sticks. It breaks the surface tension of the water, and thus you have foam lines. So again, not always indicative of a bad water source. In this case, it's quite indicative that the river here is very alive. But we still don't want to drink it. We're not designed to drink it. We got some leaves that are falling off the trees, and we have a heroic amount of pine needles gathering here from underneath the pines. So the first things first, we need to clear a space so we can put our mill bank bag in. But a mill bank bag is a heavy duty piece of equipment developed in World War II using heavy cotton for soldiers to drink. You can see it's kind of shaped a bit like a sock because some people or some survivalists and some soldiers that when they were shown how to take water from a river that you drained it through your sock and it took all these kind of big, heavy, nasty things out of it. But you don't have to worry if you have a forest fundamentals bag and it's your first time using it, there is proper thorough instructions on the side here that show you how to go about it. But first things first, we want to make the cotton do the work for us. So we got to soak it and malleable it in the water. And while we soak it and massage it, we're expanding those fibers. And we want to get those fibers nice and tight. So it looks like this. And we get it going. 
So what we want to do is fill our bag up. And again, the Forest Fundamentals bag is very clever because it has this line on it here, which I'll explain about in the next step. But we just simply want to open it up and get it down into the water. I'm not too worried about a few pine needles in because that is the magic of mill bank bags. We just want to let it fill up and gather what we need to do. You can use your cup, you can use your bottle. As you can see, I'm just scooping, I'm just filling from this less than perfect water source. Then when I have the bag full, it is time for our next step. So the next thing we want to do is use the attached cord and feel free to change this out to something that you may be more suitable to, something with carabiners or whatever you fancy. You want to suspend it from a tree and it'll naturally hang at this angle. And then if you come a little bit closer, this is less than an ideal way to show it, but it's a pedagogy video. I try my best to keep as many big things out of this water as I could, but you can see very clearly the turbidiness and those three things from the river inside the Millbank bike. Next step, we gotta collect our water. So you don't just suddenly stick your cup underneath the Millbank bag when you have it full of water. Again, the great thing about the Forest Fundamentals bag is this line is not there just for aesthetic purposes. This line is there to show you when the bag is ready to be used. So when you suspend it from the tree, this horizontal line, or this kind of obtuse line, will become horizontal. And that is a mark. So when you fill your bag up, you have to let the water drain out of here onto the ground until the water level is below this line. And that's when it is safe to collect. There we go, ready to collect. And a good indicator is this lamina flow that you see here, that we're all good and ready to go. And then you can just simply get on with the chores of the outdoors and preparing your camp while your vessel fills up with your water. And as you can see, there is no turbidiness in this, there's no particulates, there's no pine needles, leaves or anything. And that is the great thing about a millbank bag. Now we're back at camp and I wanted to take a moment to talk about the type of fire I build when I'm boiling my water. Because you never know where your, the water has been or what contaminants get on it, you always just want to be a bit extra careful. So when I build my fire for my water bottle, I like to be able to start it so that it envelops all around here, but it also encapsulates all my water bottle. You don't have to worry about getting a bit of ash in your water, but the reason why I like to do this is because it sterilizes the entire bottle, almost like a, a cleansing effect of the whole thing. I want to make sure that I have enough wood because we have to transfer an awful lot of energy from our fire to our water. In fact, over a million joules of energy we have to transfer from our fire to our water. Because as always, big bubbles, no troubles. But then when I take my water bottle out of the fire, it is completely sterile, the lip is sterile, all these little bits around here are sterile, and I know once my water bottle cools down that it's safe to drink from. So I'm gonna get my fire started, I've got all my material prepared, and I'm gonna create those big bubbles so I have no troubles. Easy game, easy life. But I thought I'd add an extra step to show you what you do to complete your water filtration cycle. So we have our five pine cones back here. The first one, like we saw at the start of the video, was turbidness or those heavy things, the things that you can see with your eye in the water. Our Millbank bag took perfect care of that. Then we built a water boiling fire and we boiled water in our container on a rolling boil, big bubbles, no troubles, for 15 minutes. That got rid of our bacteria and it got rid of our protozoas. But we still have some things left. We have heavy metals and we have pesticides. Should you be in an environment, remember to check it, always check but we have heavy metals we've pesticides and maybe even some nasty bloodborne pathogens but how do we get rid of these last two well that's when mechanical filtration methods come in so if you have a mechanical filter like the grail or other filters on the market something that removes all one shot one kill you can take your boiled water or you can take water straight from a lake. Again, I always recommend a mill bank bag. You can check out the links to our other video where I talk about preserving your filters using such a device. But you can take lake water or you can take your boiled water for extra security. Add it to your mechanical filter. Now, people say the water is still brown and still has a color to it. That's just 
tannins and other things in the water. It's not anything bad, not anything that's in our five pine cones that we need to worry about removing once we follow the steps that I've shown you in this video. We add our water to our grail container, our filter. Ooh. Ooh. Happens to all men either. You want to get a level press and just slowly squeeze down. Different filters work in different ways, but the grail works on this type of pressure. It's one of the fastest ones on the market. But there's other ones out there, the MSR, the Catadine, ceramic based filters, carbon based filters. There you go. It has removed my heavy metals and my pesticides. My pine cones are gone, my water is perfect and safe to drink.